Hey there. Um, first, I'd just like to say thank you very much for being invited here. Uh, really enjoyed getting to know some of you last night uh, over dinner. See immediately there's a lot of similarities in our fisheries and a lot of differences as well. So uh, real quick about myself, uh, Jeff Harbour. Uh, I live in southeast Alaska, in Sitka. I'm a commercial fisherman. I've been fishing for about 27 years. Um, that's what I do for a living. Fish for halibut, sablefish, and salmon, all hook and line fisheries. Um, there, I'm also involved in uh, fisheries policy and management. We have a council process, and I'm on an industry panel that provides advice to the government. Um, our next presenter also is a friend of mine, and she'll be um, uh, talking about some of that as well. So. Uh, mostly what I'm going to be talking about is sperm whale depredation, since that's what occurs mostly in the Gulf of Alaska. Um, that's sort of the range of the sperm whale depredation. Um, you see killer whale depredation further out west in the Aleutians and in the Bering Sea. And again, uh, Megan will be talking about that next. This is just a quick picture of Sitka, where I live. Um, there's some fleet differences I see right away. We have um, a lot of small boats in Alaska. Um, in Sitka here, we have almost 650 that are home ported that commercially fish for a variety of fisheries. Um, up here on this chart, Alaska, I put that oval over the area that you see most of the sperm whale depredation. Um, we have four management or six uh, management areas in Alaska. Four of them are in the Gulf of Alaska one for the Aleutian Islands and one for the Bering Sea. And I don't know if I get this. Probably not with the laser pointer, but our fishery occurs along the continental shelf, which is kind of a dark line. I realize it's hard to see now, but it's, it's about 5,000 kilometers right along a narrow band of, uh, of the edge of the continental shelf there and then on into the Bering Sea. Oh, there it is. He, you pointed right at it. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, so it kind of goes like that, out here, and then over here. And it's also important to note that there's not much fishing of any kind in Alaska that occurs outside of that. Most of our fisheries, whether it's salmon, crab, whatever, occur inside of that. Um, long lining uh, for sablefish also occurs on, uh, in the inside waters. Um, but most of the fish is taking place in federal waters. Um, same chart here. Um, in recent years, a bulk of the uh, sablefish catch occurs in three management areas, which is also where the bulk of the sperm whale depredation occurs. The average range of the fishery is in uh, 250 to 600 fathoms. Or, um, I use your local currency there as well to measure that in meters. Um, about 90% of the sablefish caught in Alaska is by the longline fishery. The rest is caught there's a, with trawl or pot fishing, and that's mostly out west in the Aleutians and Bering Sea. And this is a chart we see a lot in uh, fisheries management and sablefish. This uh, documents chronology of the catch. Uh, since 1956, and you can see some uh, spikes, peaks and valleys there, and maybe there's too many words below that, so on the next slide, I just try to summarize it. There's some important key events that happened in 1972. Uh, marine mammals were offered protection and started a rebuilding program for whales. Uh, in 1976, we enacted uh, the magnuson Stevenson Act, which Americanized domesticized the fisheries. The foreign fleet was no longer allowed to fish. They were phased out over, uh, over about 10 years. Um, and then our local fleets, our domestic fleets, learned, uh, learned how to catch fish pretty well, ramped up, effort increased, and then again, we saw a significant change in management in 1995. It went to an ITQ system for sablefish and halibut and catch has kind of gone up and down in that same levels right now. I think in uh, 2016 TAC, it might be about 20 million 
yeah, about 20 million pounds. Um, and so this is a good chart that shows where our survey occurs. We're really lucky to have uh, annual surveys in the Gulf of Alaska. Those yellow triangles are the survey stations. Um, they occur, an occur annually in the Gulf of Alaska, and then uh, in even years out in the Aleutian Islands, and then in odd years in the Bering Sea. But again, a bulk of the catch is there in the Gulf of Alaska. Some portions of the state waters are also surveyed. Uh, the damp, uh, depth sample during the survey are a little bit different than the fishery, but uh, they also sample, uh, they're also looking for some rockfish and turbot and whatnot. And I thought I'd describe what our fleet looks like a little bit. Um, like I said earlier, about 90% of the sablefish is caught by the 320 vessels that fish uh, IFQ sablefish in Alaska. This picture shows, I think, a good example of the diversity of our fleet, but it is a small fleet. I think you guys uh, might refer to it as artisanal. Um, the boat, the bigger blue boat there, is a, is a pretty good sized boat for Southeast Alaska. That would be considered a big boat. The one in the middle there is about, uh, about 40 feet long, but I think this is a good picture to kind of capture what our fleet's like. Um, they range in size from 9 to 50 meters. Uh, most of the vessels are in the 12 to 18 meter range. Uh, they're all catcher vessels almost. Um, so that means they bring fish in fresh shoreside to processors after about two to five day trips with crews of about two to three people. And this chart shows the value of fishery over time since 1985. Uh, remember in 1995 we went to an ITQ system, but you can see that the generally the value of the fishery has increased. What you don't see is this nice little uptick that we saw in 2014 in the um, wholesale, which is our, at the processor level. Um, and fishery was worth $95 million in next vessel. That's what the fishermen get paid at the dock in 2014. I'm going to circle back over here to uh, some historical factors that heighten awareness of depredation uh, 1972, again, the Marine Mammal Protection Act protected whales. We saw an increased whale populations. 1976, that the foreign fleet was phased out. That was mostly an industrial fleet, went to uh, more of a catcher vessel fleet. And then we went to uh, ITQ system in 1995. And that was a big game changer. That went from managing the fishery for in just a couple days a year down to an eight month season. So we fish from the spring to fall. We don't fish in the winter time, that's when the fish are spawning. Um, but we do have eight month season which uh, allows for a lot more opportunity for whales to, um, to find us and enjoy a few meals. Uh, what we see here in the commercial fishery with sperm whale depredation, for the last three decades, commercial fishermen have reported seeing or reported depredation um, I must really be fond of the 1995 event there. I can seem to iterate it through there. Um, by 1997, uh, depredation of sperm whales had increased substantially. Um, it's very difficult to quantify what that depredation is, but we would definitely see reduced CPUEs. Uh, the foraging behavior is a little different. It's harder to know if you're, say, if you uh, put out a long line set, maybe somebody else had just fished there and your CPUE could be low for that. Um, a whale could come around and maybe just do some light snacking or full on engage and just taking every fish off. Um, I think I'll skip that slide. So in the survey, the, uh, as far as sperm whale depredation occurs, uh, Sperm whale observations have been recorded during the long line survey since 1998. Um, in the Gulf of Alaska, I think we had about 75 stations that were surveyed, at two sets per station. 21 stations had uh, whales observed, sperm whales observed at them. The long line survey catch rates and abundance indices are not adjusted currently for sperm whale depredation. It's something uh, that NOAA scientists have been asked to look at both for the long line survey and the fishery, but there's key operational differences in those uh, 
in the depredation that occurs between the survey and the fishery. So in the 90s, commercial fishermen in our area approached uh, scientist Tori O'Connell, who's a ground fish manager, and uh, Jan Straley, who's a whale biologist. We, uh, us fishermen, were very familiar with these uh, two women. Uh, we're concerned about sperm whale depredation of long-lined sablefish. In 2003, we formed a group called Sea Swap, the Southeast Alaska Sperm Whale Avoidance Project. You know, we put together a great team. That team expanded. We've been we've been uh, very successful in learning uh, sperm whale uh, behavior. Also, uh, we're able to start exploring tools to either avoid whales or um, deter them. We started using logbooks and cameras, um, and we've gone on to a lot of other things, and Jan will talk about that later. Um, this slide here is just an example of all the different groups and organizations that are now involved with uh, CSWAP. It's a fisherman-driven program looking for practical solutions to, uh, to this issue. Um, there's a good slide here of a lot of the fishermen that were involved in the early days, and a lot of them still are, and a lot of their vessels. Uh, fishermen are very generous with their time, taking equipment out, testing deterrents, doing everything we can to, uh, to learn more about this uh, behavior and ways to uh, be preferable to avoid them than try to uh, deter them. And that's all I got right now. Thank you. <laughs>